I would like to give you my perspective on um, a more business perspective and what I think in the end of the day about whether delivery drones could be the next big step after drones for surveying and acquiring data. But before I do so, I would like to be very clear with you and tell you how much passionate I am about flying devices so that you can understand my bias. So it started already very young, looking uh, at aircrafts, dreaming about becoming a pilot, maybe to do something good with piloting, being a helicopter pilot to save lives and uh, go in urgent situations, help people with fires and stuff like this, not only showing off with girls. So I tried to become a military pilot in Switzerland, and I had the opportunity to fly very nice aircraft, turboprops, but I got fired towards the end of the, uh, of the process, and that was, I think, a good thing for me, because then I could keep going with my engineering studies, and in the end, do some research about bio-inspired flying devices, taking inspiration from flies and insects, in order to turn those learnings into interesting uh, flying devices that could fly, for example, in cluttered environment, avoid obstacles, avoid eating uh, people. And finally, create SenseFly, which some of you may have, have heard about, and I will say a few words more uh, in a minute about this. I didn't stop flying since then. I kept flying, for example, aerobatic airplanes, exploring the 3D of the sky. I did some uh, competition at the national uh, level. I also learned landing on skis in a difficult situation. For example, this is landing on glaciers where the performance of aircraft is really uh, limited and where you always have issues with wind, with uh, visibility, with sun glazing on the, on the ice and stuff like this. And more recently, I started to fly helicopter and also learned to fly helicopters in difficult areas like landing in the middle of trees, confined areas. And uh, so I know about you know, landing those crafts in uh, situations where you don't have a nice runway and sometimes it's also very cluttered. But let's go back to uh, mapping drones. So mapping drones, SenseFly basically um, is, is the company who became the leader in revolutionizing the way surveyors would work. So basically putting drones in the hands of people that didn't want to fly drones at all. They really just wanted to have a better tool to map more efficiently um, a certain amount of, uh, of sites. So SenseFly, that has been founded back uh, 10 years ago, in 2009, as a spin-off of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, quickly became the leader in this fixed-wing autonomous mapping drones. Uh, just to sh give you a few numbers, if that works, we managed to sold thousands of those uh, EB drones uh, worldwide through a network of 200 points of sales. So it's really a, a worldwide coverage. And we have also not only points of sales, but points of maintenance, because it's very important to be able to service those people, to make sure that they keep operating with, with their uh, new mapping device. And all of this at an average selling price of around 20,000 USD. So this make a reasonably successful business in the sense that we, can pro we could prove uh, pro pro profitability after a few years of operation. SenseFly, just to give you an idea of the business, uh, of the company's size, is more than, slightly more than 100 employees nowadays based in Switzerland. And we do a lot, we spend a lot in uh, research and development to prepare for the future, to always keep uh, improving our products. But we also have a department looking after industrialization, supply chain, production, basically assembling the drones, testing them, etc. And we have to take care about marketing sales, take care of the distribution network. So that's, I think, is one of the rare companies nowadays that have proven profitability in the drone area business, outside of the consumer world. And uh, I'm also quite proud of being able to say that uh, when the economist draws the map of the world of drones, well, you will find the Chinese, uh, of course, we, know, we all know the multi-copters coming from uh, DJI, for example, or Unique. Or on the other side of the spectrum, you will find the big uh, military drones coming out of the United States. And somewhere in the middle of those two uh, extremes, you will find the EB drones from SenseFly. 
which position Europe in, on, on the map of drones. So what are mapping drones exactly? Well, basically, it's not about carrying heavy loads, it's just about carrying cameras and flying a li little bit like a lone mower in a systematic way over a certain given area. And what really made the difference back in 10 years ago, there were no um, uh, possibility to have a drone that would do that by itself. So you would have to learn to pilot those systems. Now, as you've seen today, those systems are fully automatic. So you can put them in the hands of professionals that have no clue about piloting systems, and those systems would just go grab the necessary uh, data. And by taking all of those pictures, you can recognize features on the ground, visual features, from different perspectives. And this allows you to create, after the flight, a 3D map of the site, which is very useful for many people, like uh, professional, like uh, surveyors or like uh, uh, mine uh, managers, uh, stock managers. They want to measure volumes. They want to measure uh, to draw the contour lines of the sites. But also people that want to, you know, build new roads, etc. So the drone that we develop is a range of drones, basically, but they look more or less like this. They are smaller than the ones we saw today flying. They are more less than two kilograms. One uh, meter wingspan, very simple design, two wings only, one pusher props, and all the necessary electronics brain in order to do the flight by itself. So this is just to show you that a very simple device, of, of course there is a lot, lot of uh, AI uh, inside it, can revolutionize the way people actually grab data. With such a mapping system, you can go really much faster than going in the field, measuring each of the points with a theodolite or with a GPS or with a laser. But I think what is very important in that case, and it's more the business perspective, is that those systems bring a true return on investment to the customers. And we have seen many of those customers that have seen a uh, five to four times time savings on their projects. So ju by just leaving aside their good old um, uh, way of measurement and go for drones, they could really spend money, uh, spare money in a very fast way. So just to give you an idea, when a surveyor needs to go out to do uh, a data grabbing uh, session, they would ask between maybe $500 to $2,000. So the cost of a drone represents only a small part, but can be significant in that uh, mandate. And therefore, the drone can be very uh, easily, um, uh, can bring a return on investment very easily. So that's very key. And also in agriculture, now we see people, we see situations, cases where drones can really bring, um, can really allow growers to reduce uh, the amount of fertilizers they put in the fields while increasing the yield. So basically gaining money and again finding a quick return on investment on the spending on the drone that will provide the intelligence uh, uh, of the, the crops. So now the question that uh, some of the organizers asked me to try and answer is, is delivery drone capable of bringing a, a sound business case or not? So that's a difficult one and I think it's very early stage right now. But let, let me give you my perspective. So of course there are very positive uh, signs out there and we have discussed that already uh, this, today and we'll keep discussing that in the, in, in the coming days. But there is, I think, more and more of a social acceptance. Ten, days, uh, ten years ago when we started with SenseFly, drones, we even could not, could not use the word drone because drones were seen as military objects. I think now more and more people are seeing that drones are bringing good uh, um, impact, and as we discussed, uh, delivering, saving lives, etc. So all of this, and also more and more people have those drones um, uh, as toys, so they see that they are not really dangerous. So social acceptance is really rising at the five space. Also, we hear more and more working groups on how on rulemaking for drones, thinking about maybe we should avoid having those uh, drone makers certifying their system as if they were full manned aircraft. And uh, maybe there is a more risk-based approach that could work for drones because basically drones are flying, are uh, uh, less massive, they, they provoke less risk, and especially if they fly in areas where the density of population is low, like flying over water, for example, then there is no sense of certifying those. And you also have to keep in mind that the drone is not a simple aircraft. If you compare drones to uh, manned aviation, even small ones, 
drones are more complex because they have autopilots, because they have software, because they have uh, fly-by-wire. All of that is a nightmare uh, if you look at, at those complex systems from a certification point of view. So applying certification of full man aviation on drones is an economical nonsense, I believe, and also a nonsense in terms of level of risks. And now regulators throughout the planet start to think like this. So there is um, also a push uh, in uh, electric powertrains. They become more efficient. They are not yet at the level of, uh, of gasoline uh, engine, but we are coming there. And uh, we have to acknowledge that there is an improvement year over year of something between 3 and 5%, depending on the, on the reports, of uh, ba um, uh, battery energy density. So that's a good sign. And the, the, the trick also is that electric motors are far more easier to integrate into systems that are innovative. As you, as you have seen a few drones today, you can put several of those engines, you can rotate those, which was not possible uh, in full man aviation, or very difficult, maybe some of you know about the Osprey and stuff like this, much more difficult to achieve uh, in the full man aviations. Autonomy is key, of course. Autonomy means that you can spare the weight of a pilot. Autonomy means that you can operate safe, more safely. And autonomy is also seeing nowadays a very decrease in terms of price. We see now open source systems that cost almost nothing. I'm sure that most of the people uh, show, demonstrating their drones today uh, are based on, on some kind of open source software and even uh, hardware architecture. So the cost of an autopilot, the cost of autonomy is really descending at a fast pace and basically replacing efficiently the cost of a pilot wage. Now, how can we ask ourselves the question whether we can do a good business with drone delivery? Well, that's the tough one. So I took as an example, as a baseline, as a benchmark, if you wish, I took the, uh, as I call it, the life bank case. So it seems that operating a fleet of motorcycles to deliver uh, important and urgent medicine products cost all included wages, everything, infrastructure, costs approximately cost of ownership of the motorcycles and everything, costs something around 50 cents per kilometer. So I think this is a very good benchmark of the, of the cost of transport. A drone should be able to achieve or approach or a flying device in order to be competitive with such a way of delivering things. So I did my small exercise and uh, put this 50 cents for the motorcycle, and of course a motorcycle is not very expensive, and I asked myself, well, if I took a small helicopter to do the job, maybe it would be a nice um, activity for me and now that I'm not anymore CEO of SenseFly, and flies those uh, products, could I be uh, competitive with the motorcycles? Well, the answer is no. It would be 10 times more expensive. And uh, this is based, so it would be good because if helicopters are faster, you can carry up to, I don't know, 300 kilograms outside the, the, the weight of the pilot, but still the cost of operation would be quite high, and this is based on, the, on numbers that you could find in typical uh, helicopter companies. And interesting to note also is five uh, uh, dollar per kilometer also includes everything, so the wages, the insurances, the cost of, uh, um, of putting the helicopter in a hangar and everything. And this is based on the number of hours of flights per year of 500, which is not typical for a private-owned helicopter, but quite classical in, uh, in, um, in the case of operation of rescue helicopters, for example. Keep just that, the number in, in, in your mind. So then I ask myself, could I do it not with a helicopter, but with a, with a uh, small uh, short takeoff and landing system, a bush flying aircraft, uh, an aircraft that would take off very rapidly, maybe just uh, 60 meters and you're in the air, and an aircraft that has big uh, wheels so that they can land easily on the countryside. Well, the answer is it's still three times more expensive than the motorcycle, even though the, the, the acquisition price is low. So, uh, we have to do it with a drone. Get rid of the pilot, get rid of some of the uh, overheads, and the number would look more or less like that. So I'm sure we heard today about numbers. I'm sure that we can come up with a drone that would cost approximately the price of a big car. So I took 30,000 uh, uh, USD. And at that price, we can certainly not have something that looks like a small helicopter, manned helicopter, but we can certainly aim at that kind of numbers. We also heard about those numbers today. 70 km per hour is really a conservative, a reach of 150 kilometers. 
and uh, uh, payload capacity between five to 10 kilograms, but that should be far more than enough for last mile delivery of many, in many cases. Well, I end up being able to, uh, I end up on this number of 50 uh, US dollar, all included of the price per hour. And this is very tough to achieve, in fact. It's uh, far, far less than the helicopter and the manned aircraft. And this makes me think, with some estimation, you can, you can always discuss the numbers, of course, that this drone would have to fly much more than a manned helicopter in order to be able to be profitable. So if you would be there to build a company that would do that, you would have to fly those drones a lot. And when I mean a lot, I mean more than 10 or 12 hours per day, which means that this brings a lot of challenges together with that. And that would be my concluding side, slide. So of course you need drones that are very reliable, much more than the mapping drones that I discussed before, that would fly maybe once or twice a day, sometimes 10 times a day, but only once per week. So, and every 100 hours, usually you have to do a servicing, a maintenance, and if you fly 5,000 uh, hours per year, you would do maintenance every week. So your system has to be reliable, has to be repairable. You have to be able to make sure that the supply chain is working, that you can have the, 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 the components uh, in a timely manner. And you also have to make systems that can fly day and night in every weather situation, so wind, rainy, etc., in order to make them uh, really competitive with motorcycles. And of course, all of that wouldn't be possible if you don't have a very strong, so since you need to fly a lot, you can imagine that you will, have, you will need a lot of drones and, uh, in, a, in a hub, therefore a high uh, traffic density. And this cannot be possible without an uh, unmanned traffic management system, and we'll learn more about this tomorrow, I believe. This is coming. So be able to make sure that those drones are not colliding, be able to uh, dispatch those drones correctly, and communication may also still be an issue. And I'm sure that the Lake Victoria Challenge will help trying to understand at what pace we can tackle those uh, challenges. Thank you for your attention.